The central clock, located in the suprachiasmic nucleus of the brain, has long been recognized as the master regulator of circadian rhythms, including the sleep-wake cycle. However, we now know that all cells express the so-called clock genes that have important time-of-day effects on normal physiology. Furthermore, diseases such as acute myocardial infarctions occur more often in the mornings, and drug therapies appear to be more effective when given at specific times of day. Unfortunately, we know very little about the basic physiology that accounts for these time-of-day effects. As a result, the Physiological Society and the American Physiological Society co-sponsored a symposium, Circadian Regulation of Cardiovascular and Kidney Function, presented at their joint meeting in Dublin, Ireland in July 2016. Speakers in this symposium provided compelling evidence that the peripheral clock can explain a wide range of time-of-day effects that include regulating cardiac, vascular, and renal functions. The clock genes are transcription factors that regulate expression of a wide range of genes, including the other clock genes and genes that control fluid and electrolyte handling. It is clear that the kidney and liver are the two organs with the most genes that have a circadian expression pattern. Dr. Michelle Gums at the University of Florida has reported that the clock gene PER1 is an early aldosterone response gene and that PER1 regulates downstream targets such as ENAC and endothelin expression that are key elements in control of sodium reabsorption in the collecting duct. In her presentation, Gums suggests several provocative ideas that should be the focus of future work. These include finding the cue or Zeitgeber, that sets the overall timing of the circadian rhythm in the kidney. Is it light? Is it food? Or maybe it is something else. Given the importance of the kidney in control of blood pressure, it is easy to speculate that maintenance of clock gene expression is important for allowing blood pressure to dip at night. Non-dipping is considered a relatively unappreciated form of hypertension that is not detected in normal clinical screens. Dr. Glenn Rodrigo from the University of Leicester has observed that the magnitude of the vasoconstrictor responses, such as with sympathetic stimulation, follows a time of day variation. Since vasoconstrictor responses can be modulated by the level of endothelial derived relaxation, Rodrigo and colleagues went on to demonstrate that endothelial NO synthase, or NOS3, mRNA expression follows a 24 hour rhythm with the nadir being during the inactive period and the peak during the active period. Block 8 of NOS3 with L-name eliminated the time of day variation in the response to either phenylephrine or potassium. Consistent with these results was the loss of the temporal response to vasoconstriction in endothelium denuded vessels. Also, deletion of major clock genes, such as with BMOL1 or PER2, alters the time of day differences in endothelial dependent relaxation. Whether these diurnal differences have any role in physiological control of blood pressure or total peripheral resistance is not clear since NOS3 knockout mice maintain normal blood pressure rhythms. However, there is some evidence that the vascular response to secondary insults may be impacted by time of day. Dr. Martin Young from the University of Alabama at Birmingham has been studying circadian variations in heart metabolism that appear to be controlled by the cell autonomous clocks. Young and colleagues have developed cardiomyocyte-specific knockout mice for the clock and BMOL1 genes. Transcriptional analysis revealed that these genes primarily regulate genes associated with transcription, signal transduction, transport, and metabolism. These findings led to the hypothesis that the cardiomyocyte cell autonomous clock functions to prepare the heart for fluctuations in metabolic demand associated with sleep-wake and fasting feeding cycles. These investigators have gone on to demonstrate that disruption of the core clock eliminates circadian patterns of glycogen and triglyceride synthesis that are normally associated with metabolic demand during periods of activity versus inactivity. In terms of protein metabolism, Young and colleagues have suggested that lower protein synthesis during active period allows more efficient use of ATP for maintaining cardiac function that is then shifted during rest to allow for normal repair processes. Finally, Dr. Tammy Martino from the University of Guelph addressed the issue of potential therapeutic options for assessing cardiovascular risk associated with disruptions in circadian rhythms. 
Her group has provided new information on how timing of pharmacological treatments could provide more effective therapy as well as reducing risk of mechanism-based adverse events. This work has led to ideas for designing hospital rooms and clinics as an adjunct for implementing chronotherapy and provides more effective treatment regimens in line with patients' circadian rhythms. In conclusion, it is clear that time of day variations in physiological and pathophysiological processes need to be considered as a part of increased rigor in biomedical research, as well as an important factor in the problem of reproducibility. Thus, it is important that this area of research be recognized in a much wider context, as the complexity of the core clock and peripheral clocks in regulating physiological processes is fertile ground for many new discoveries. <laughs>